we're going to get into the Word, and I don't know, I don't know where the Lord's going to take us in this today, but we're just going to jump into this and see what He does. Amen. Lordship, ownership, stewardship. I hope you're not um, getting tired of this series, because every week when I dive into this, it just seems like the Lord just continues to expound. Every one of these messages every week could stand on their own. But they all fit under the umbrella of this theme, lordship, ownership, stewardship. So let's put this next graphic up here. Now, in this series, we've tried to cover some things. We've asked a lot of questions. And I hope that these, these questions are being answered for you. When you declare that Jesus is Lord over your life, do you really understand what that means? How much access does Jesus have to my life? Should every act in decision, be subject to the permission of Jesus? Do I really understand what lordship, ownership, and stewardship means? Over the next few weeks, let's go ahead and put this next one up here. This is what we've been talking about. Each one of these have been a separate message. What is lordship? Lordship is accepting God's sovereignty. Secondly, lordship is a God-first life. Last week, we ended the third part talking about accountability. So lordship accepts responsibility. We spent one week on that, and then we spent last week on accountability, and it's all building up. And then this week, we're going to talk about lordship is doing God's will, and then finally, lordship is personal obedience no matter what. But let's put this next graphic up. This is where we'll park it, because we really needed to touch on that last point about responsibility and accountability to fully understand what we're going to dive into in this message. Lordship is doing. I want you to see the focus of the word here. Doing. It is doing. It it is not talking. It it is not just sharing. And that's all great. But now we got to get to the doing part. And this is where the Lord wants all of us to be, is to get from the knowing or the talking or the praying, which is all good, and get to the doing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for this message. Lord, I thank you for everything you're doing. I thank you the kids are with us here today. And Lord, I thank you for a church with kids, young people and teenagers and young adults. I thank you for that, Lord. And Lord, I pray that as I minister this word, everybody, even the kids are going to get something out of this. That Lord, they're going to hear your word and your word will not return unto you void. Lord, let it be planted into the heart of every listener today, everybody watching online. Lord, I pray that right now you speak revelation and insight to everybody that's hearing this word today. And Lord, we ask that your will be done in everything that we do. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Lordship is doing the will of of God. Now we're going to get in 1 Samuel chapter 15 here in just a second, but let's put up this first scripture. I'm going to go over a couple as we begin. James 4, 17. It says, therefore, to him that knoweth to do, to do, there's the word do. Remember, lordship is doing, doing the will of God. So James says, once you know, once you have a revelation, once you have an understanding of what it is that you need to be doing, you will be accountable. And if you don't do it, It's sin. Let's go to the next verse. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. When the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit is come upon you. Now, I want you to stop there for a second because the Holy Spirit is for more than just goosebumps in a church service. Amen? Listen, I love those goosebumps. I'm going to jump right in with you when we're going to have goosebumps together. Amen? Amen? We're going to shout together and jump together and praise together. I love the Holy Spirit, amen, and I love the power of the Holy Spirit. I like laying hands on the sick and watching them recover. I like taking authority over the enemy. Those are all manifestations of the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. The Bible says signs and wonders will follow those that believe. So, I mean, you start talking about the Holy Ghost, man, I'm right there. We're a Holy Ghost church. If you didn't know that, hopefully you know it by now. Amen. Some people come in here, they don't know what they're getting ready to walk into. But you know what? People, even if people don't understand, as long as they leave and they can say, you know what? I might not understand it, but I think God was in it. And that's okay. But I want you to notice the next part of the verse. 
the Lord says that that power, now I want you to notice, I want to focus on this, because it's all about doing the will of God, okay? You shall be witnesses, not go out witnessing. Pastor, are you against going out witnessing? No. I, I believe we all ought to witness to people, amen? Some people have a special calling to go out and knock on doors. Some people have a special calling to do street ministry. That's evangelism. Amen, that's one of the office gifts as an evangelist. You know, we, we think evangelists as being people that go out and schedule meetings and they go to churches and uh, I'm going to be here for a weekend or a week. And uh, I mean, that, yeah, I could say, yes, that is part. But really an evangelist is somebody that goes out and shares the gospel. But I want you to notice the wording here. He says, you shall be witnesses. Unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. I, I, I want to present to you today okay, the thought that when you're doing God's will, it is a witness to everybody watching you. This, this, what, what am I saying? People are watching you. And they're wanting to make sure that everything you say lines up with everything you do. If you're going to preach to somebody, you better live by what you're preaching to other people about. If you're going to point your finger, you got, you know, I've always heard you have four pointing back at you, right? So you need to make sure that whatever it is that you declare, you're living. That's the doing. So I want you to notice, the Lord says that you are a witness. A witness is somebody who has witnessed the presence of God. They, they've witnessed the promises of God. They've witnessed the power of God. And because it's a part of who they are, just simply being who you are makes you a witness. You, you don't have to force it. You can just get up on a Monday and go to work. And just walk in the Spirit, do what God called you to do, speak the way God calls you to speak, and you're doing the will of God, amen? And by just simply doing that, you are a witness. So I'm going to connect all this together here. So let's go back, let's put this next point up here. Okay, I'll come back to this. Doing. What is doing? Doing is defined as action, performance, and execution. Remember, we're talking about doing the will of God. He that knoweth to do good. He that knows what action he should be doing. He that does not uh, carry out the performance that he should be doing. He that doesn't execute what he should be doing. If you know what you should be doing and you're not doing it, it is sin. So doing is action. It's an action word. It's a verb. No pew sitter should be in the body of Christ. We shouldn't have anybody on the sidelines doing nothing for the kingdom. But I'm waiting for my season. Listen, I get that. You might be waiting for a season in that area, but you ought to at least be doing something in another area. Right? It's an action word. Do something. I met with somebody this week, they, and, and I love their heart, and, and they said, I just, I just want to do something. I love my church family, and I love the Lord, and... And I just want to do something good for the kingdom. And, 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 I'm, and that's what I like. I like it when people are like, you know what? I know that there's some things down the road that maybe I'm going to ultimately be doing. But along the way, I'm still going to be doing something. I want to be active. I, I want to perform what the Lord's called me to do. I want to execute what God has called me to do. Does that make any sense? Because see, when you look up this word, and I'm going to tell you, I'm combining 30 years of pastoring with this, and this is the unfortunate part of it. There are people who have yet to transition into doing God's will because they, will, they realize that they will have to rearrange some things in their life. I mean, I mean it's, it's easy in the safety of doing nothing. It's easy to be critical when you're doing nothing. It's, it's easy to point your finger at others who are engaging and executing the action of what it is the Lord's called them to do. But let me tell you, when I look at the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, I've yet to find the, the manifestation gift of a critic in there anywhere. I see a lot of doing in Scripture. I, I see a lot of engaging in doing what God called you. I don't see anything in there about criticism. But there's a lot of people that realize that when I go from sitting to doing, i got to rearrange my life. i got to sacrifice some things. I might have to rearrange some priorities. 
I might have to actually put the kingdom as first above other things. I might have to rearrange some uh, scheduling with my life and my kids and my grandkids. I might have to rearrange uh, my attitude because with this attitude, I know God can't use me. If I'm a whiner and I'm a complainer and I'm negative and, and I do, God can't use me if I got that. Out. So if I got to get to, are you seeing this today? And I think this is a big reason why a lot of people are just not doing is because they realize Jesus is going to come in and say, I'm holding you accountable to be a vessel to be used for me. But if you want to do, if you want to be active, if you want to execute, you're going to get some things straight. You're going to get sin out of your life. You're going to have to get your attitude straight. You're going to have to get your priorities straight. How about this one? You're going to have to get your finances in order. Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And if your treasure ain't there for me, and your, that means your heart is, and if your heart ain't there for me, I don't want you doing anything for me until you get that heart right. That's some good preaching. Let's go to the next uh, slide. First Samuel chapter 15. Now, I'm going to navigate through this as quick as I can because I don't want to park it here real long. But I want to point out a, a word that is here. The first Samuel chapter 15, verse 1, Samuel also said unto Saul, this is King Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you to be king over the people, over Israel. Now, therefore, hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. So King Saul, the people wanted a king, and so the Lord's chosen you. And so now you're going to have to do what God called you to do. I'm going to anoint you to do it, but you're going to have to hearken to the instructions that God's getting ready to give you. Verse 2. We'll get through this. I want to focus on one verse in particular. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. So, so the Lord knew, you know, Saul was big in stature. That's why the people wanted him to be king. And so this is the first action as king. God says, okay, I'm going to use you, and we've got some enemies, and you're going to have to take them out. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to perform. You're going to have to execute. You're going to have to do what I've called you. It's going to take some action. You just can't stay in your palace and, then, and walk in the anointing. You're going to have to get out and do something with the anointing. Are you getting this? Go to the next verse. I want you to go smite him. I want you to kill him. I want you to destroy everything, and I don't want anything to be spared. Man, woman, infant, suckling, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey, the kids are in the sanctuary. Verse 4. And Saul gathered the people together. And it gives the number. Go to the next verse. We, we all don't know the story. I want to focus on one particular verse. And Saul came to the city of Amalek, and he laid wait in the valley. Verse 6. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them, for you showed kindness to the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So the Canaanites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul smote the Amalekites, verse 7. And verse 7, it says, but he took Agag. So he didn't follow the word of the Lord, what God told him in verses 1 and 2. He took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, he took him alive, and, and he destroyed everything else, but he kept that which was good. And he was disobedient, and, and, and Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and the oxen, and the fatlings, and the lambs, and that which was good. This is what's key. They held on to what they thought was valuable. He couldn't do God's will because there was something in his heart he felt was valuable he could not depart from. He couldn't do it. It just was not a part of his care. I wonder how many of us in here just can't do God's will because there's things in our life that we just can't let go of. I can't, I, can't, I can't rearrange my priorities. I can't, I can't rearrange my attitude. I can't rearrange my schedule. I can't rearrange my finances. I, I just I can't do this, Lord, because there's some things in my heart that I have yet to resign to you. I'm telling you, there are people that are just not doing God's will, and they're content with sitting back and watching other people do it. People in the body of Christ, anointed by God. I want you to get this. This whole theme today is about family, right? This whole theme of what the Lord is doing is we're all one body together, right? But there are some people content and watching other people do what they know they've been anointed to do. That when there's a need, they're going to wait for somebody who's already doing something to do that to while they do 
nothing. Why? I can't let go of these things. I got too much that I need to hold on to. And God said, I want you to kill it all. Are y'all getting this? Go to the next verse. Verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, you know, God watches it all. And it says, it repents me that I have set up Saul to be king. He turned his back from following me. He hasn't performed. There's that word again. He hasn't performed. That's, now, I want you to notice that that word is part of the definition of doing. Doing means action, performance, execute. But pastor, ministry is not a performance. I get that ministry is not a performance. But if you look up the whole definition of the word perform, it means to carry out. That's what it means. We'll talk about it here in just a second. So he didn't carry out the full instructions that God gave him. Remember, Lordship's doing the will of all of the will of God. There are things in my life that I would rather not do. When I signed up to be a pastor, you know, I thought preaching messages, praying for people. Man, I got that certificate on my wall. License in the church of God. Man, this is awesome. Got that nameplate on my office. And ministry is going to be all about loving on people, leading people to Jesus and worshiping the Lord and, and preaching the word. And man, it's just going to be awesome. And then you find out that that's the easy part of ministry. And then the Lord says, you need to deal with this situation. And the Lord says, you need to deal with this ministry. And the Lord says, you need to do this. And then, and then you start finding out what ministry is really about. And I'm telling you, along the way, my flesh has not always wanted to do the will of God. How many of you don't talk about? There's things in your life you don't want to have to do sometimes. There's times that, 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 that I sit back, and I do. I, I'm like, Lord, this wasn't part of the job description when I first said, here am I, send me. Ha- having to deal with this. You know, because as a pastor, and some of you have been in ministry, you understand what I'm talking There's just things you don't want to have to do. I don't want to have to stay up until late. I don't want to have to get a sleepless night and have to deal with it. I don't want to have to take this phone call. I don't want to have to respond to this email. I don't want to have to set up this meeting. And then the Holy Spirit puts things on your heart and says, I want you to do this. I want you to do that. Are you getting it? The key word here is do. I want you to do this. I, I want you to establish. And you're like, Lord, no. And, and it's funny because we debate the Lord. Lord, do you realize what the fallout's going to be if I do this? Lord, do you realize if I do this, I'm going to make somebody mad? If I do this, somebody's going to be offended. If I do this, somebody's going to talk. But see, I've had to get to a place in my walk with the Lord that I cannot be Saul, that I hold on to the things that are easy to hold on to, and that in order to do the will of God, there are some times I'm going to have to make a lot of sacrifices, and that I'm going to have to do things I don't want to do and say things I don't want to have to say, make decisions I don't, and on top of that, when I'm married with my wife and, and sleepless night, I mean, you don't, you don't understand the times I'm like, in my mind, in my mind, I'm like, I'm disengaging today, tonight, I'm going home, I'm, re- I'm going to have some, I'm going to have a dentist day. No, I'm sorry, that's what I call it. I'm going to have a dentist day. And dentist day gets busted. Many a times. You know. And, I mean, you don't need to hear me give you the laundry list of all the things through the years that, that I've had to do as a pastor. I signed up for it. Kicking and screaming, there's times I do God's will. And some of you in here know exactly what I'm talking about. You do God's will. Kicking and screaming. I don't want to do that. My flesh doesn't want to do it. My emotions want to do that. My carnal nature doesn't want to do that. But you know what? In the end, when your heart says, God... I signed up for this and I said I was going to do this because Lordship's doing your will no matter what, no matter what it costs. No matter what happens. I'm not going to be like King Saul and hold on to the things that I don't want to give up. I'm going to fully perform the word of the Lord. And then he comes in here in verse 12. It says, And Samuel rose up early to meet Saul in the morning and it was told Samuel saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a place, and he's gone about, and he passed. So he's given the prophet the location of where he's at, so he shows up, and he's got a word from the Lord. And he's going to let him know, God's rejecting you. Why? Because you wouldn't do. You wouldn't fully do. 
you would not fully uh, perform and execute what I told you to do. E even the part you don't want to give up. And, and you know what I found out? And, and I'm being honest. This was the first order that was given to King Saul. The very first order. And it was almost as if, and, and God's done this to me sometimes. It's almost as if before you move any further, I'm going to give you an order that's going to strike to your carnal nature and to your pride. I'm gonna, it was like with Abraham, but before you become a great nation and before I, I want you to sacrifice your son, your only son, because I'm going to test your heart and see if you really love me more than you love the promise. And, and when Abraham was tried and, and he was supposed to put Isaac on the altar, you got to understand, yes, Isaac was his son. Yes, it was his offspring, but real, it was the promise. It was the one thing that God said was going to happen to his life. And he had to lay his promise on the altar and sacrifice it to God. And so all through scripture, you see this happening. The Lord testing the hearts of those that say, God, use me. And the Lord tests our heart to see if we're going to do, listen, no matter the cost. And that's what happened here. And he shows up and the prophet shows up and confronts him. And what does Saul do? Verse 13. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Here it is. Here's the word I have performed. I, 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 I'm going to give the definition here. Just say, I have performed the whole commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, then why am I hearing sheep bleeding in the distance? I hear the bleeding of sheep and the lowing of the auction, which I here. I believe that's the last verse that I have in there. Let's put this next graphic up. Let's put this definition. This is the word perform. So doing means action. It means execution, but it also means performance. Saul used the wording. Now we know, because we know the whole story, he did not perform the will of God, but he says he did. Because in God's eyes, the word perform means to execute, to fully do, to fully do, to, to carry out, to go through and execute in the right manner, to fulfill and to fully accomplish. I'm, I want to inject this in because you need to get this. When you accept the call of God on your life, it is not a spiritual sprint. It is a marathon. And there are a lot of people that I see that accept the call of God. And in the beginning, man, they are excited. They are excited because they're active and they're getting to do something. Some people get excited for the wrong reasons. Some people get excited for the right reasons. But they don't understand this is the long haul. And one thing I had to learn the longer I became a pastor is I'm in this for the long haul. See... I can't get upset at a family member and just go find me another church to pastor. But church people can do that. I can't. You can get mad. I'm going to hold my tithe. But you know what? Because I'm in it for the long haul. And I know what it's like. If I got to get me a job to go with the call, you know, because I, I, church can't afford, I'm just going to do it. Why? Because I'm in this for the long haul. Why? Because when I gave my heart to the Lord and I said, here am I, send me wherever the Lord was going to send me. I'm going to fully perform and execute and fully do and carry out and go through and execute in the right manner, fulfill and fully accomplish everything God called me to do. No matter what roadblock comes my way. It doesn't matter. I'm going to do this. I gave my word. When I stood before God in the presence of family, and friends, and I made an oath to my wife, and I made a vow to her, and I promised I will perform the duties of a husband, a godly husband, and I will love you in, in, in sickness and in health, good times, bad times, amen? More inches around the waist. I'll love, I'll love you. I'm going to stay with you. If you get sick, I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to be beside your bedside. 
When life throws everything it can, I'm with you. Why? Because I said I will perform the duties and I will fully execute it. But I'm telling you, church family, I have never seen an epidemic like this in the body of Christ like I do today. Where pe- people look at you wrong. You don't agree with the decision. You don't, un- you don't like something that was done. And people sit back and they're like, no, I'm not going to fully execute and execute in the right manner and fulfill and fully accomplish what I said the Lord called me to do because now it's becoming inconvenient. Because now I might have to forgive somebody. Now I might have to swallow my pride. Now I might have to rearrange my schedule. Now I might have to do... Am I making any sense in here today? Now I might have to do something that my carnal nature just doesn't want to have to do. And man, it was easy to do it when the Holy Ghost was moving and I was at the altar and they were pouring oil on me and I got a prophetic word and made sure everybody heard that. Do you all hear that prophetic word? Woo! And then when I really engaged in it, Man, I didn't realize the fine print. You know those commercials when they, it's in the commercial. Right? That's the fine print. Man, I didn't realize when I signed my name on the dotted line, I didn't realize that is what I was going to have to do. And I didn't realize I was going to have to give up that. But you know what? If he's Lord, Lordship's doing the will of God. It is executing. It is fully doing. It is carrying it out. It is going through in the right manner. Every jot, every tittle, every cross T, every dotted I. I'm going to fully accomplish what it is. It doesn't matter the inconvenience to me. And it doesn't matter if i got to swallow my pride. And my wants and needs have to be sacrificed for the greater good of what the Lord has called me to. Am I making any sense in here today? I will fully accomplish the will of God in my life. No matter what. Let's go to the next slide. In Matthew chapter 25, and I'm going to read this out of, my, out of my Bible, so give me just a second here. We hear Jesus talking about the very famous parable of the talents. And he says in verse 14, he says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered to them his goods. Now see, That's the thing that I've had to resolve in my life. What I have isn't mine. My giftings are not mine. My office is not mine. I mean office gift, five-fold ministry. The anointing on my life isn't mine. My giftings aren't mine. I had none of them until God weaved me in the womb of my mother and said, separate Dennis Sanders and and I'm going to put in him what he needs to execute and fully perform what it is I called him to do. Everything he needs. He might not know that I've given it to him, but I am. And he's going to go through some things in his life that he doesn't know it's there. But when the fire hits it, I'll refine him and he'll become a greater vessel to be used for the kingdom. And so that's what Jesus does to all of us. And he's trying to remind us today It's my gift. It's my calling. Here, here. this is Jesus. Jesus says, it's my ministry. It's not yours. It's mine. To one he gave five, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability. And he went away. Took his journey. And then those that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made five more. And those that had... Two gained another two, but he that had received one dug in the earth and hid. And even if he admits it's the Lord's money, it's not mine, but I'm going to hide it. I'm going to explain to this real quick before we close. After a long time, the Lord of the servant came and he reckoneth. Now, when you look up the word reckoneth, now I don't have this in, in in the PowerPoint slide, but write this down. This is what it means. To calculate, to settle accounts, get this, expectation. So so when you look up the word doing, when you look up the word performance, when you look up the word execution, and then you look up the word reckoning, these are accounting terms. 
in the Lord in heaven before you were born had a book written for your life. And when he anointed you for service, he expected you to do everything you needed to do to figure out what it is, receive direction for what it is, to get training for what it is, to submit to authority, spiritual authority, to carry it. All, all those things God is wanting you to do. You, listen, it's on you. And this is, one, this is one of the things I've had to learn in my life. I understand my role as a shepherd to motivate. I understand my role to try to, you know, push people along the way. But this is what I, when the day's over, this is what I found out. If people don't want to do God's will, they're not going to do God's will. They're going to sit on it no matter what I do. And I could mentor, I can pour in, I could call, I could message, I could weep with, I can cry with, I can pray with, I can try to motivate. But if somebody wants it bad enough, they're going to do everything it's going to take to do the will of God. And Jesus said, when I come back, I'm going to reckon things. I'm an accountant. And how many of you know God's the best accountant there ever was? And, and I'm going to tally I'm, I'm going to calculate. I'm going to settle the accounts because I have an expectation. So th 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 this is kind of, are y'all with me today? It's getting really quiet. I don't know, sometimes maybe you're just listening. So so the Lord says, I'm going to come back, listen, and settle my expectations. So do you think God would have an expectation for your life and not fill you in on it? Do you think we're going to stand before the Lord and we're like, man, I had no idea what you expected out of me. No, we don't serve a God like that. We serve a God of grace and a God of mercy. And so this is what it tells me. It's because we don't like what we're hearing like King Saul. And what I'm going to do like King Saul is I'm going to kind of add to the command. And, and, and what I do want to do, I'll do. What I don't want to do, I won't do. And I will justify it. Now, when the prophet came to Saul, that was his response. I have fully executed the will of God. And I believe by taking that story and lining it up with this parable, that there's going to be people that are going to stand before the Lord and, and they know they didn't and they're going to say, we fully executed your will, God. And Jesus is going to say, well, let me open up the ledger. <laughs> it's humbling. How many, I'm just, how many of you know it's humbling sometimes to open up your checking account and you're like, woo. <laughs> wow, that's not what I thought was in there. <laughs> Come on, who's with me? Am I right on that? I mean, you're the doctor. It's a, you don't, you don't want to open the email. You don't want to, when the doctor says, I need you to come in, tell, you're like, I don't want to hear what he's going to tell me. Because it's reckoning. And the problem is, is we can do that in our world. I took my car to the mechanic. <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> and I don't even want to know what it's gonna, what's wrong and what it's going to cost me, right? We don't like those things. We avoid at all costs everything we know we should be doing because we know what it's going to cost us. But when it comes to God, you can't do that. Is anybody in here humbled by this? Verse 20, and so they had received five talents, came and brought the other five, saying, Lord, I got five more. Well done, good and faithful servant. Verse 21. You were faithful over the few I gave you. I'll make you ruler over much. The one that received two, he came and the Lord said, Lord, Lord, you delivered unto me two, and, and I've gained two more. I've, I've fully executed. I've done something with it. And the Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. But then in verse 24, it says, then he which had received one talent, this blows me away. Because when I dissected these verses, we're, we're in, and we're, we're here in a second soon <laughs> this is crazy 
he accused the Lord of something he wasn't. Two accusations. He was so deceived that he accused the Lord of things he knew wasn't right. The first one was this. I knew you were a hard man. I knew you were dry and I knew you were tough. That's what that means when you looked at it in the Greek. I knew you was tough. And so we know it's a lie because usually when we know somebody's tough, we want to execute it, right? But he didn't. He accused the Lord of being something he wasn't. You're a hard man, and you reap where you haven't sown. Now, I want you to think about that. I want you to think, um, now, dissect this, because sometimes we read this, and we're like, what is he talking about here? He said, because you're a hard, I knew that you reaped where you didn't sow. This is basically what he's saying. You were expecting a harvest on a seed you didn't sow. What? This is what he's saying. You didn't give me what I needed to execute your will, and you're coming back and expecting a harvest? So he flipped it. Are you getting this? You're wanting the harvest, but you're a hard man, and you expect things when you didn't plan it. Are you getting that? I think about half of you got that. I want you to think about this. I want you when you dissect this, think about this. Lord, you didn't give me what I needed to execute your will. And you're such a hard man, you expect things when you didn't give it to me. An excuse. I want you to notice that the ones with the five and the three talents never thought the ruler was hard. The one that was given more didn't think he was hard. The one with the five, the one with the two didn't think. They never accused him of it. Only the one looking for an excuse accused him being a hard man, in reaping where he has not sown. Basically, you're expecting a harvest that you didn't plant, where you didn't give me a talent. Now, I've been accused of being hard sometimes. And what gets me is that that's the excuse people give when they don't perform God's will. Well, it was just too hard. The pastor was just too hard. The the, the pastor's requirements were just too hard. Are y'all getting this? Um, The pastor expected something I couldn't give. And I sit back and I'm like, that's how we do it. But what does he say? I was afraid. And because I thought you were hard and because you, you really didn't give me what I needed, I hid it. But at least I'm giving you back what you had. Now, I want you to look at the next verse in particular because this is the response of Jesus. The Lord answered and said unto him, you wicked, what's that mean? You degenerate and undeserved character servant. He says, you're slothful, what's that? You're lazy. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never had to talk to anybody about ministry and say, you're lazy and you have a degenerate character. (laughs) Amen. Amen. But Jesus does. Because I just just wish my pastor was like Jesus. (laughs) You sure about that? (laughs) I've, I've heard that, man, I, through the years, uh, you know, man, I just, I, I just, I wish Pastor Dennis would just pass like, because Jesus, you know, he just, oh, he's just, it's just all rainbows, and, and, listen, <laughs> Jesus calls people lazy, degenerate character, five of the seven churches in Revelation received a rebuke, Jesus, let me put it to you, you wouldn't want Jesus to be your pastor. Be thankful you got me. Amen. (laughs) But notice this. You knew. Look at this. Thou knowest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strewed. So now (laughs) the Lord gets a little sarcastic. Now I'm not recommending sarcasm, but he said it to prove a point. 
It's a parable here. So you've got to understand what he's saying. He comes in and he says, you should have at least taken my money to the exchangers. And then at my coming, I would have, have received mine with usury. What's that mean? Interest. You've got to understand that back in biblical times, there were changers. And what would happen is people would borrow money at a certain interest rate. And then they would take that money and then loan it to someone else at a higher interest rate. And then when that person paid it back to them, they made a profit. And so when they went back to the usury or the treasury, what they would do is they would give the debt they owed and they would hold on to the profit. And so the Lord comes in and says, you must not know too much um, about the accusation that you're making because you know good and well that if you'd have at least taken this path, or I'd had at least a little interest on the one talent that I gave you. But because you buried it, you don't even have any interest. Are you getting this? So verse 21 is more sarcasm. It's an extreme opposite example explaining the depth of the man's excuse. And Jesus used terminology that he knew exactly what he was talking about. So what does he say in verse 28? Take therefore the one talent from him, give it to the one with ten. For every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have an abundance. For from him that, him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he has. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's break this down. Can we go back to verse 14, Sierra? Can we go back and look at this real quick? I'm going to break it down. We're going to close soon. Verse 14. One thing we realize is they were the master's possessions that was entrusted to the servant. You have to look at your life as not your own. You have to understand that none of this is yours. When you look at verse 15, we go to the next verse. The gifts were not equally distributed. I want you to hear me here. Now, this is big. I got to point this out before we end this lesson here. You will not be judged on the magnitude of what you bring back to the Lord. You will be judged on how faithful you were with what you were given. And, and what that means is stop getting your eyes on someone else's office that wasn't given to you. Now, you know what I mean when office. I'm not talking about physical office. I'm talking about a spiritual office. If, if the Lord gave someone like Loren, okay, tenfold gifting in singing, okay, she's an amazing singer. Now, if Loren's sick or on vacation, I'll fill in. I am nowhere near the singer as, as Lorraine, but I'm like, I'll take my one talent, God. <laughs> I give it back to you, okay? But see, this is what happens, okay? I don't want her calling because I'm not anointed to do it. And some of you need to get your eyes off what somebody else is doing and get your eyes on what you're doing. Get your eyes off someone else's five talents or two talents and take what you have. Don't be jealous. Don't be envious. Don't want it. Listen, if some of you knew the price tag, <laughs> I'm taking, you know, it's fun. I want to be a pastor. I'm like, oh, oh Jesus. Because it's funny when, when I start sharing about some of the things I've had to go through, it's, it's funny, man. People that are young in ministry are like, what you had? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're called a pastor. Here, go. No, 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 no. Like, no, 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 no. People have no idea. And this is, I don't want to be my state overseer. I don't want to be the pastor. Of, if God called me to pastor the church of God, I don't want to look at somebody else pastoring another church and say, man, I wish I had that church. Man, I wish I had that building. I wish I had that exposure. I would, no, no, no. If, if, if I was meant to have it, I would have it. If that was meant to be my calling, then that's what I, So what I've got to do is say, I'll take what I've been given. I will be faithful with it. Let the Lord bring increase to my life. I'll be faithful with the little. And when I'm faithful with the little, then I'll prove to the Lord that I could be a good steward with what he gave me. 
Are you getting this? Verses 16 through 18. When it talks about the one with the five, and it talks about one, the one with the two, and then the one with the one, this is what it tells us. People will respond differently to what God has given to them, unfortunately. But you cannot let the response of someone else motivate your response. Some, because they settled the lordship issue, have no problem with obedience, but some do. Don't worry about it. You stay in your lane and do what you're called to do. And then in verse 19, when it says, after a long time, the Lord comes and reckons. It teaches us that you and I are going to be accountable for what we do with what God gave us. No matter how small, no matter how large, every single one of us are going to be accountable. And see, this is where obedience and increase comes from, okay? Our faithfulness to doing God's will in the little opens us up to be given more to work with. If you don't like the amount of talent that God gave you, be faithful with what he did and watch the Lord increase it in your life. It's only when we're faithful. Why? Because there's no, I'm telling you, there's no shortcuts. If you take a shortcut, you're acting like Saul. And the Lord rebuked Saul and took his took his office gift away from him. There's no shortcuts. Because I guarantee you, when you see somebody else that's being used by the Lord, you don't know the price they've paid behind the scenes. You have no idea the sacrifices that they've made. You don't know the sleepless nights. You don't know the pain. You don't know the prayers. You don't know the fasting. You don't know what they've went through. Am I making any sense in here? There's no shortcuts. Luke 16, 11. Or 10, excuse me. Luke 16, 10 says this. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful in that which is much. The Lord always gives you a small amount to see how faithful you will be with it. And it's only when you're faithful with the little that he will give you much. The problem is, is we want much. But there's a price tag with that much. When... Jove and I went to Leader Labs. I'm close and I am. Soon, when Jove and I went to Leader Labs, we went through three or four of the levels of leadership training. Fred Garman's got all these pastors sitting at the state office and, and he opens it up with his little bell, ding, ding, ding. And he gets everybody sits down. All these pastors, pastors of big churches, little churches, we're all sitting down. And he opens it up with a picture of a clean car. I thought, I like this guy already. (laughs) A picture of a made bed. And this is what he said. Y'all in here thinking you want to do something great for God. He said, make your bed every morning and keep your car clean. I'm like, what? And he was relating the fact that we need to be faithful in the little. He related to the fact, he said, when you can make your bed, you make it a habit, and every morning you make sure your bed's made. And he said, you don't want people looking at you, and you go on about how anointed you are, and you got trash falling out of your car when you open your door. People sitting in there, and you got gunk all over the, the dash. Man, I've seen some cars. I'm like, man, that didn't just happen overnight. <laughs> Ooh. But you know what it does? It shows how faithful you are. And I learned that in leadership training. Because on one hand, we want to do more for the kingdom. Oh my goodness, I want to do more. And then God says, here's one there. Be faithful. So we got that on one hand. But then on the other, once we're given more, then we're a little intimidated. (laughs) Because we're like, woo, man, how am I going to do this? This is why we've got to learn the lesson of just doing as God lays it out as he charts our course, as he gives us our path, as he rewards our obedience and gives us more, just be obedient, do God's will, and watch the Lord fulfill what his will is in your life. Let's stand together.